Okay, my name is Sergio Demian Lerner, and uh, I'm an Ethereum fan and Ethereum, part of the Ethereum community since its beginning, uh, when I did the first security audits of Ethereum code and design. And uh, currently, I work for a company called RSK Labs, which is developing an Ethereum-compatible uh, sidechain to Bitcoin. But today's talk is about a research I did a couple of years ago that applies both to Ethereum and to RSK and to any other blockchain platform. So the talk's name is the blockchain virus. Can a blockchain pay to replicate? Can a blockchain itself pay for all the resources it needs to survive, like a, an organism? Or it could have been called how to roar full nodes or it could have been called how to create a reward-based peer-to-peer file sharing system controlled entirely by smart contracts, by no additional blockchain, okay? So first of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about decentralization because we wouldn't be here if not because we appreciate decentralization. And any attempt to build a cryptocurrency or smart contract platform in the past that was centralized just failed. Okay, so this is what we must stand, this is what we must uh, try to, to, to keep. So why is decentralization so important? Well, it brings back the power to the people. So it means a lot of things like people being able to audit their payments, disintermediation, having open access, no central control, no monopolies, no central point of failure, and of course, censorship resistance and corruption resistance. These are very, very important properties of our networks. So how do we promote decentralization? Well, first we have to identify, measure it, and then we can see how can we improve it. So one of the ways is increasing the number of independent implementation developers full nodes, okay? And another way is by reducing the cost of running a full node. Because as the network scales, the cost of running a full node increases. So if I have to depend on a third party to know uh, about my transactions, then it, the network is going to be centralized. And last, the actual full node topology is very important. If I take a node out and then the networks disrupt or disconnect, then of course this is not a good decentralized network. But we can see that in all kind of ways that we can improve decentralization, it's very, very important to have full nodes. We cannot live without full nodes and have decentralization. So what is a full node anyway? Okay, a full node does a lot of services to the network. It broadcasts blocks, transactions. It also hides the node's IP, so we don't give an attacker the possibility to gather all information about the network and do uh, partition attacks or denial of service attacks. Also, a node provides filtering uh, services for light clients. And of course, the most important function, it has a copy of the state and the blockchain to serve to new nodes that want to bootstrap and you know, sync with the network. But what are the incentives to run a full node currently? There are none, okay? So currently it's quite cheap, so we do it, but in the future we don't know. So anything we can do to reward full nodes will uh, foster decentralization. So how can we do this? Well, there are very simple ways, but most of them do not work. For instance, we can create peer-to-peer -peer pay services, like creating a micro-channel from one node to a peer, then I can easily, or a, a probabilistic payment, which also works, and then I can just ask for a block, and then you give me that block, I make you a very small micro-payment. Well, the problem with this setup is, of course, that we can have proxy nodes, and proxy nodes can, you know, charge a little more and just uh, uh, forward the request to another node. And so they just are there to, you know, to, they don't know contribute to decentralization, it just make the network uh, be uh, more expensive. Some other cryptocurrencies, some other networks rely on some call, something called master node. Of course, this master node regularly ping nodes so they can vote uh, so which nodes have to be rewarded. This, of course, 
uh, has a lot of problems with centralization. These nodes are centralized. And also, these nodes gather a lot of information about the IPs of the nodes, which is something we want to avoid. So I will present a third way of doing this. And the interesting thing is that this is a communication between smart contracts and full nodes without any other user or external system intervention. So basically, there is a smart contract that will say something like this. Give me a proof of work that proves with high probability that you store in your own hard disk a copy of the blockchain. Okay? Or that you are so irrational that you are willing to buy a lot of hardware just to fake this proof. But you will spend more, more money than just buying the hard disk to store the file. Okay? And I will tell you if nobody else finds that you have cheated. So if the full node A submits a proof in transaction data, then another full node can come and say, no, this proof is fake. And the smart contract can evaluate this proof. This proof must be able to be evaluated with very low amount of gas and can keep a pre-deposit, uh, A's pre-deposit, and reward B for providing that useful information. So in, um, to summarize, we want a, a node to be able to prove to all remaining nodes in the network that is storing the blockchain. Okay, so the benefits are obvious. We can detect proxy nodes. We, we, we won't pay uh, proxy nodes. And we don't require any special change to the network for the nodes that don't want to participate. And maybe the drawback is that we are not actually proving we are serving the blockchain. We are proving we have a copy of the blockchain. But since we have a copy of the blockchain, we are in sync with the network, uh, almost sure we are serving it. And the cost of serving it will be small. So to, to manage to do it, we, are need, we need some cryptographic protocols. Okay? So these are the uh, previous attempts to, to do this kind of thing. So we have provable data possession, which allows you a, a, a verifier to send some data to a server and then challenge the server to see if this data is still there. Also, we have proof of retrievability, where the same uh, verifier can also uh, have certain assurance that it will be able to recover this information in the future. These two are uh, called proof of storage. So I will present a protocol, a very simple protocol, which is I called proof of unique blockchain storage, that it's a proof of storage scheme, but also allows you to ensure that the other party, the server, has an actual copy of this file. Okay, so this means that this file will be related to some, some identity. Okay, so the same file cannot be related to two identities. So it's interesting that this year uh, Filecoin presented a very similar proof that they call proof of replication uh, that I also, I also published a couple of years ago. And it's the, kind of the same idea, but it's worse. And I will tell you later why it has uh, many problems. So in a nutshell, we take the file we want to prove possession, and we will encode it together with an identity. And this identity will be generally your node address, your Ethereum address or RSK address. So what we need is that the coding is fast. But it should only be fast enough you know, for, for not to interfere with your network operations. Uh, on the contrary, appending and updating will be a much slower operation. But again, not slow enough to interfere with operations. The property is that when you encode a file and you encode a second file, there is nothing to share in these encodings. So the server will engage in a challenge response protocol with a verifier, and he will use the encoded data, not the encoded data, but just the encoded data. And will, it must be irrational uh, from the economic point of view to do anything else, like uh, uh, relate to another party or like having a supercomputer or whatever. So this is how the peer-to-peer -peer protocol goes without, without smart contracts. So there is a honest verifier say, give me the hash of n pseudo-randomly selected uh, blocks of the file and that have been encoded with your node address. And please do it in less than one second. So the honest prover has the information, just put the information to memory and hash it and it works. Now, if there is a, a malicious prover, he can think of two things. Okay? First, he can think, okay, I'm going to relay this same query, the same challenge to another party. 
But the problem is that the, res the response he will receive is related to another identity. So he's not going to get paid. He's just going to be paying another party. If he wants to redo this encoding, it, the problem is that it takes a lot more than one second. Okay, So in a sense, he cannot uh, fake a proof. So to create this asymmetry, we need, we need something I call practical asymmetric time encoders, or PATIs. So we have a program, which is an encoder. We have another program, which is a decoder for a certain Turing machine. And we define the steps that this program performs as the number of steps it requires to run for a random input until it holds. And we will ask that this uh, steps function is mostly uniform. So we, we, we said that we have two programs. And we said that decoding. Uh, if, you, if I encode an input and I decode it, I get the same input. So we define the asymmetry ratio as the number of steps it takes to decode divided that by the number of steps it takes to encode. So the desired properties are, of course, the program must be small. And if, I, if there is any other party uh, that encodes the same mapping, then this function, this uh, uh, sorry, this encoding must be relatively equally efficient. Efficient, okay. And to guarantee this, we need to rely on some uh, complexity assumptions or number theoretic assumptions to make sure that the encoding that we pick is one of the fastest uh, encoding possible for that mapping. Also, we want, as I said, that the coding and encoding speeds will be. Uh, um, practical for our application, and we want the highest possible asymmetry ratio, because that is going to protect us from the attacker trying to encode on the fly. Well, there is a function that has these, uh, these properties. It's called the poly Hellman cipher, private key cipher. It's a very, very old, one of the first number theoretic uh, encryption systems. It works like this. To Well, in, in this case, it's the opposite. Decryption would be like encoding, but uh, so to decode um, a value, we just rise it to the third power modulo of big prime and bit prime. And to encode it, we will rise it to a value u, which has approximately n bits, which is the inverse of the um, of three modulus p minus one. So we get this encoding decoding property. So using the standard square and multiply algorithm, uh, encoding would take 1.5 um, times n multiplications, while the coding takes only three multiplications. So the asymmetry ratio here is n divided by two. Okay, so we can make this asymmetry ratio as as large as we want just by taking a, a prime which is you know larger. So what are the practical parameters that we can choose that serve uh, this purpose? Okay, I tested it in my laptop with a libgmp. Uh, so for n equals 2048, this is a bit, little bit technical, but please follow me. Exponentiation takes uh, 2.8 milliseconds, while three multiplication takes only uh, 3.6 microseconds. So the theoretical uh, asymmetry ratio is uh, approximately 1,000. What I measure is approximately 7,077. So now think about the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, so we get one megabyte block every 10 minutes, and it takes only 11 seconds to encode it. So it works perfectly for Bitcoin, and it works also perfectly for RSK and for Ethereum. And the coding is really fast. You get 30, 71 megabytes per second, so that is not going to interfere with your uh, node operations. If you want to get a higher symmetry ratio, you can take n equal uh, 20k, and, and, and you still are in the bones that you can still use for encoding uh, your blockchain. So this, this is the one-time blockchain encoding um, step. Be, you take uh, your blockchain or your file, and you split it in n-bit chunks, and then you scramble each one with your node address. And this scrambling is, can be very simple, can be just sorting with a, a full domain hash of the, of the node address, and then you encode it with your slow function. So this is what a typical proof of uh, a storage looks like. You have a, some kind of memory bone problem because you want to prove you have a lot of, a lot of data, and you transform it in, into a disk I.O. problem. 
like this. You take a seed, the verifier will, will send you a seed, and from that seed you derive a number of positions in the file, and then you will just access those positions and, and build a hash. Okay? Well, the problem with all these constructions is that they depend on this technology. So if I use SSD, then the, the parameters are completely different if I use a hard disk. And also, these this characteristics, properties, change all over time. So this is what we really do. We first do the step of encoding and creating this asymmetry. And then we receive from the verifier, in this case is the poops contract, the proof of unique uh, blockchain storage contract, we receive a C0. With this C0, we will take some parts, we will derive some indexes, some parts of the blockchain or the file, and we will bring all these into RAM. Okay, so we are independent of the technology, the disk uh, access technology. And this is the challenge response uh, preparation phase. Now, we have, we receive from the smart contract, like 20 seconds later, a second seed. Okay, seed one. And well, from seed one, we will derive these indexes of RAM where we will take these small pieces, small blocks, and hash them. Okay, well, we have transformed this memory bone problem into a CP bone problem. Well, there is some important problem here uh, that we cannot do this from a smart contract is that the block interval can be about 10 seconds, 20 seconds. So the number K, the number of pieces we have to hash to prevent an attacker doing this encoding on the fly will be very, very high, okay? Like in the order of uh, 20, 20 thousands or maybe more. So the proof that we get is very large and the smart contract won't be able to, you know, uh, with the gas limits to, to evaluate if it is correct or, in or incorrect. So we changed the last part and we transformed a CPU bone problem into a memory bus IO problem. And this has been done. Oh, uh, this has been done in uh, Parmacoin, for instance. The same, the same procedure. So instead of taking a large number of, uh, of uh, blocks to hash, we take only 40. But we request that the hash that we obtain has proof of work. Okay. So we will try many, many times, like deriving new seeds from the seed one and anons. You know, try a lot of times, maybe 20 seconds or 10 seconds, until we get one that has this property of the proof of work. So this is how the whole protocol works, and it's very, very simple. So in the step zero, we have this one-time encoding. But we also have that full nodes will register with this Poops smart contract. And this can be, they don't have to rebuild their IP. They just have to register a... Uh, uh, RSK or Ethereum address to be paid. Also, they will do some pre-deposit because they are going to be penalized if they present an invalid proof. So in step one, the proofs contract will derive the seed zero from the block hash and will give the nodes enough time to bring all these pieces or a big piece into RAM. So in step three, the, the proofs contract will derive a seed one. And now the competition begins that it's not a competition, it's cooperation, actually. But uh, the full nodes will try to get this proof of work. We'll try to get from all proof candidates, we try to find one that matches, that has a ta match, that whose hash is lower than the proof of work target. So they will submit these proofs to the blockchain in normal transaction. There will be plenty of time, like six, six blocks ahead to prevent censorship so that they can do that. And in step six, the, there is a deadline for this. And then an external challenge phase begins. In this phase, full nodes will try to see if the other nodes are, being, are cheating. So they will pick the nodes and the, and the hash that has been commit from other full nodes and will reevaluate those proofs. But since there are only 40 elements, then it takes about 100 milliseconds, so they can just uh, evaluate every every other full node's uh, commitment. If one of them finds that someone has cheated, 
then it just sends a fraud proof to the blockchain, to the Poop smart contract, which is just the full expansion of this, of this proof, which will show if the original commitment was correct or incorrect. So in step nine, there is a end uh, a deadline for proof submission, for fraud proof submission, and then the rewards have been paid. Of course, they are, o they are only going to be paid to the nodes that are behaved honestly. So because the, the reward is going to be shared, uh, nodes, full nodes are also incentivized, incentivized to detect cheaters. Now, what's the difference? I, I said before that this protocol can be used to prove any file, not just the blockchain. The blockchain is the easiest one because the node already has a copy of the blockchain, maybe, so it can more easily um, evaluate things. But it can be used to any file to create you know, a file sharing system that you can reward node just to hold the data for you. Uh, and, and multiple copies. You can just create a contract that f creates a uh, hundred copies of the same information. But there are some differences between the file coins proof of replication and proof of unique file storage. Proof of replication depends on the success time. So it's difficult to tune for all kinds of disks. And it gives you typical asymmetries of about 10 to 100. So it's very easy that technology changes and then an attacker is able to, to, uh, to fake proof. On the contrary, proof of unique file storage does not depend on access time and has typical asymmetries between 1,000 and 10,000. And also, you can combine them, so you get 10 times more. You can combine uh, 10,000 uh, of asymmetry ratio of, uh, of uh, proof of uh, unique uh, file storage and combine them with you know, 10 times more for uh, proof of replication. Well, the summary is that well, decentralization, decentralization is very, very important in these networks. And increasing or setting a, a full node reward for the first time, we can uh, f uh, incentivize the creation of new full nodes and keep the number of full nodes, even if we request them to store 10 times more information. And this proof of unique uh, file storage and proof of unique blockchain storage allows you to prove that you have this unique copy of the file of the blockchain. And the important thing is this can be done right from a smart contract with almost no gas consumption. And also the proofs are very short. It's just a hash and a nonce. OK, so this could be implemented in, in Ethereum or in RSK tomorrow. Uh, well, we are working on implementation. And so when we open source, you will be able to, to, to play with it. So thank you very much, and the organizers.